This is Once More With Feeling, and this is a show, this is a series that really was born out of the idea of what happens if we actually give audiences a chance. So new music, it, it has so much that's, that it has to overcome, right? Like you go to an orchestra concert and you hear what that piece sounds like on two and a half hours of rehearsal. Or in a better scenario, you get to go and you listen to a piece of music and new things are flying at you and you don't have time to quite process them. So our thought was, what if we let the audience actually go through a second time and did a little explaining in the middle. So that's, that's what we're here for. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is a special night because this is the first time we're doing it once more with Feeling, featuring a dead composer. Yes, um, we are really delighted to have Dr. Kendall Briggs with us here to uh, il just illuminate this piece for us um, as our special guest tonight. Tonight's show is all about the night. And I'd love if you would go back in to your memory and think about a place that you've been to where you actually experienced, if not silence, a place where there were no human sounds other than your own. For me, I've got a memory of, of something in the North Woods of Wisconsin, where all of a sudden the cicadas are just so loud, it's almost deafening. Or all of a sudden, uh, what would otherwise be an innocuous tree becomes a monster because you can't quite make it out. The nighttime is so magical because of the unknowns to it. And these unknowns can be beautiful, they can be inspiring, they can be sinister, they can be so many things. And this music that you're gonna hear tonight is music that really is about heightening your sense of hearing. So if you think about being in that nighttime place that you dreamed up in your head there, chances are that your other senses started sharpening right? Because you couldn't see. All of a sudden your hearing became very pronounced. And so that is really what this piece is trying to do. And it's also making space for us each to have our own experiences with it. So without further ado, we are going to play the front half of Einsi La Nuit. We will then invite Dr. Briggs up on stage with us uh, to discuss the piece a bit. And then at the end, uh, we'll be playing the piece in its entirety for you. Thanks so much for being here.
Hopefully you heard how much we love this piece, but we're going to tell you a lot more about why that is, and we're going to invite our special guest up to the stage. Kendall Briggs is a professor at the Juilliard School. He's a pianist, a composer, and a music theorist, and it just so happens that I got to know him because I was not able to take his class. <laughs> Um, for real, though, uh, Kendall's class at Juilliard is one of those like classes of legend that everyone who's a senior, you know, passes down to the people who are who are younger. Um, as something that you want to make sure to have in your schedule. And for some reason, I could not, and I've regretted it ever since. Um, and as soon as we started working on this piece together, actually, old friends of mine and uh, colleagues got in touch and were like, you know. If you're, if you're playing this piece, you really need to call Dr. Briggs because he's a specialist in this piece and he's been analyzing the score for over 10 years, 15 years maybe. Um, so anyway, we've been uh, working with Dr. Briggs on Zoom, um, getting to know this piece and that inspired to invite him here and share some of this with all of you. Um, so I'd like to bring him up on stage now. Please help me <laughs> welcome Kendall. I get to take this off of <laughs> Hey, he has a face. I have a face, yes. I'll never forget a uh, student uh, was walking out of the building and we had been wearing masks for weeks and he I took it off and he goes my goodness you have a goatee I have no <laughs> idea and I said yes yes I have a goatee <laughs> two seconds can you all hear me I tend to talk really loud I may not need a microphone but we can do that and that would be there good. you need it now I can see all right, so joining us all the way from New York, Dr. Kendall Briggs, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, and I want to thank Clara and May Doyle and Russ for inviting me here. This has been so much fun. You have no idea. I haven't been to Chicago in a very long time, so I'm very grateful. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. So we're going to start with a uh, just a you know little lofty old question. Um, we would like to know, and I think our audience would like to know, how did this piece come into being? Like, why does this exist? It's a fun story in sort of a backhanded sort of way, as many commissions uh, happen in the world. Um, when Dutia had um, come to America, he had met uh, Ernst and Rita Sussman, who were uh, both in the arts community in Boston and New York City. And uh, Rita had introduced um, Dutia to many of her friends who were sculptors and artists and taking him around and, and got him involved in the arts community because art was something that he really, really loved. When Ernst passed away, she, uh, Rita approached Olga Puskovitsky and said, do you think we could get a composer to write a piece in the memory of my husband? And so it was Olga Puskovitsky who approached Dutia and asked him if he would write a piece for them. And of course, since he was already friends with them, he couldn't say no. So <laughs> he did it, and that's how it came to be. And then he began to, uh, to sketch and write. And the interesting thing about you know, how this gets to the premiere is another sort of story that has a, a back end to it. Um, he starts writing studies for how to create sounds on the quartet. And you heard some really remarkable sounds played on these instruments that you don't normally hear in a Beethoven or even a Bartok string quartet. And so he created these studies, etudes. They were little tiny pieces. They are now in the Library of Congress. No one has ever played them, so we don't even know what they sound like but you can go and take a look at them if you want to go see them there. And so he sent them to the Juilliard String Quartet because the Juilliard String Quartet was going to do the premiere. 
And so they started practicing and they started working on these little etudes. And they would communicate back and forth with each other from Paris to, or from France to, the, uh, to New York. And the Juilliard Quartet had lots of questions and they were kind of unsettled by some of these sounds and things that the string quartet was asked to play. In the meantime, as most commissions do, there are other groups who are going to play the piece. The Paranin Quartet in France was going to do the French premiere, but that would have been after the Juilliard Quartet. But the Juilliard Quartet asked if they could have more time. And so the Paranin Quartet um, was the one to give the French premiere, after the world premiere first, and then it was the Juilliard Quartet who did the final, or their original premiere, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it came to be. Thank you. So I want to jump right to the, the title of the work, because it's, it's pretty unusual for a, a string quartet to, at, of this time period still, uh, to have a programmatic title at all. Um, and it's a very evocative one. Where does it come from? Ein Sin Lan Lui, Thus the Night, is, as we've been talking about tonight, a night piece. It is a nocturne. And it comes from a tradition of night pieces that you can trace back most popularly to Bartok. We all know Bartok. His second movements of most of his pieces we would call, they're not titled, but we would call night music. You hear the bugs. You hear all the animals, you hear all the sounds of night. It's very noisy. And you can hear some of the noise that we're in, we're in the instruments here about things that you could relate to the sounds of night, bugs and animals and other kinds of things. And the title itself didn't really happen right at the beginning. Composers don't generally do that, unless it's something really, really specific that was in the commission. I want you to write a this, I want you to write a that. But for him, he was writing a string quartet. And the whole idea of what it might be didn't really come into effect until much later on. And the same with the titles of the movements as we'll talk about them later. But the title comes later in the game. You know, so we, we commission a lot of composers and a lot of times we talk to composers and they talk about, well, when I was writing this piece, I was really obsessed with this one thing or, or this concept, whatever. What can you tell us about what Dutiu was really, was thinking about? Was he, what, what was he obsessed with um, when he was writing this piece? His obsession has been with time and memory. And if you all know Marcel Proust, um, In Search of Lost Time, or as some of you might uh, know it as Remembrance of Things Past, and uh, like many who are reading it, there's this one particular kickoff point uh, in the book, in all seven volumes. And by the way, it was never, ever finished. Think about this, In Search of Lost Time. How do you ever find lost <laughs> time? I mean, think, just think about it. Seven volumes and never finished. You see, it could have gone on and on. But the most important thing is this quote that we have back here. So I'm going to read it for you. No sooner had the warm liquid mixed with the crumbs touched my palate uh, than a shudder ran through me and I stopped intent upon the extraordinary thing that was happening to me. And it's all happened to you too. An exquisite pleasure had invaded my senses, something isolated, detached, with no suggestion of its origin. And then suddenly, the memory revealed itself. We've all had that happen. The taste was of that, of the little piece of Madeleine on Sunday mornings at Combray. And of course, this was all about having that little uh, taste of the Madeleine, and then what happens? The memories start coming and flooding back. When you think about memory, and this is going to be it the trajectory that we're going to head to is what happens when you do a memory? You get the memory and then you run forward and then you run backwards and sometimes you ride sideways and sometimes you run up side and downside. And so memory happens in a whole interesting way. And music is all about time and memory. You cannot experience music without time because you must put aside time to hear it and experience it. And within that parameter of time, 
You must deal with memory. Because what is it that you want most? Oh, I heard that idea and I really liked it. I want to hear that again. When is that? Will it come back the same way? Or will it come back differently? For Mozart and Beethoven, it comes back pretty much the same way. But when you're thinking about Proustian memory, it might not be quite that way. Yeah, I mean, you're saying, rightfully so, you know, so many musics deal with the concept of memory. Um, and one common device that a lot of composers use is the concept of a light motif, which maybe some of you have heard of, which is sort of, um, um, a, a theme that rec recurs through a piece that's sort of associated with an idea um, and uh, you know a situation, a character, something like that. And Dutiu himself kind of rejects the concept of leitmotif. So could you talk a little bit about um, like what is it that he constructs that's different than that? So if any of you are familiar with Wagner, the operas in it, he has what are known as leitmotifs. We can trace this concept back to Berlioz in the Symphony Fantastique, where this idea is there. And it presents itself over and over and over and over again in the same garb, in the same dress, maybe a little bit of different makeup, maybe a little different wig, but basically the same thing. Um, Dutia rejected that whole idea because he said the light motive can become extremely irritating. <laughs> it reveals an identity immediately. Here I am again. It's still me, I'm here, I'm here. That's problematic unless you want to be that obvious and you want to be that out there in, in front and say, yep, this is the same thing over and over again. I really want you to just remember the way it was. For Dutiu, it's not that way at all. Because for him, he believed, like Proust did, that when you begin and experience a piece of music from the very beginning, and we travel through time, you are different on the other side, just like the music is going to be different on the other side. What you have experienced through time changes you, and it changes the material and the things that you have experienced through time. So for him, he rejects the idea of repeating in the exact same way, like the leitmotif, like a recapitulation. To him, that's a bore because it doesn't represent our actual experience in time. We want to be able to be here, but now, 35 minutes later, we are different because the music has transformed us. Our experience has changed, and therefore the materials have to be different. Recognizable, we can have a memory of them, but they've got to be different. Why don't we um, go forward and talk a little bit about the form of the piece? Fantastic, my favorite thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so tell us about how it's put together and how it's structured. And I'm going to put throw a slide up on the screen so we can follow. So along. when you go to a concert and have a program in hand, this is what you will generally see. These are the lists of the movements of things. Do composers conceive of their work in this way? And the answer is no. Absolutely not. But you can learn a great deal by looking at this if you study it carefully. You will notice that there are some words that reappear. You notice Nocturne 1, Nocturne 2. Look at where they are in relationship to the introduction and suspended time. You see that? If you drew a little arc from them, you would see that they would match up second uh, movement and second to the last movement. Then take a look at litanies. Litanies one and two. Do you see they follow over the axis of symmetry there? So there are some symmetrical things that are there. And so what I want to do now is, is to take a look and see what it looks like in a composer's mind. This is how composers look at it. And isn't that beautiful? It is totally symmetrical. Do you see? Match the colors on either side of that little red arrow in the axis of symmetry. And you see how beautifully it's put together. You also notice that there are tempo markings there. 
I just want to point out the tempo markings in the blue boxes in the center that surround the axis of symmetry. Notice parentheses two and litanies one have exactly the same tempo marking and parentheses three and litanies two have also the same tempo marking there. And so there is a symmetry to this music. There is a symmetry in its construction and you're going to be asking a question in a minute and it might be in your mind already, what do these movements mean? But I think that comes later in our little <laughs> chat. But, but it's important to see that a composer doesn't put this kind of music down as a random act of violence on music paper, which some people might think it might be. Oh, if this might sound good. Let's try this. Let's try this. No, it is very much thought out in a very specific way. Dutia is a constructionist. He wrote 37 works in his whole life. That's it. How many did Mozart write? How many did Beethoven and Haydn write? How many did Bach write? 37, that was it, because he would work them over and over and perfect every little thing about it. So, let's see, what's my next thing here? So, you want to tell us a bit about the parentheses? Yes. And how they relate to the larger movements? Let's talk about the parentheses here. So, let me ask you a question. Do you all know what parentheses mean? What is a parenthesis? What is it function? In, in, in syntax and grammar, what do, why do we use them? What's some, what are they for and why are they here in music? So a parenthesis is a word or a clause. It's like a little explanation of something that has gone before and something that has gone after or will become after. And I'm going to read a little quote that came before um, that Duccia had to say about these things because I think it's important and I missed a little bit earlier. Parentheses are like reservoirs of what is about to happen or what has just happened or even of what is going to happen much later in the work. I've often described them as beacons. You all know what beacons are of light. Depending on where you turn that light and where you shine that light, that's where it's focused. And so these parentheses take the two musical ideas that we're going to discuss and shine them backward and forward and in all different directions so that there are a series of beautiful relationships. And so that little um, uh, chart that we had up here oh, gives us, you did good, it's good. Parentheses one. Um, is going to look back because it's got to remind you. You've got to have a little reminder of what it is that's important in this piece. So there's going to be a chord that you're going to hear about and learn about and there's going to be a four note little motive that's like a melody, like a little motive that you're going to learn about. Parentheses two looks forward. You'll notice that down below it says line C chord broken and then turn motive and then he does the reverse. Switches them. Parentheses three looks back, but also looks forward. So you have one that looks back, one that looks forward, one that does both. Parentheses four, back twice to the introduction, to litanies one, and then look forward to the uh, movements that end the work as well. So these little beacons are important for him. What we're gonna try and do is show you what to listen for in all of this stuff, all right. Let's do that. So, so. We, um, we've talked a little bit about how he's using the, the concept of memory in the form. Let's explore how this notion of memory uh, permutates all the way into the harmonies that are chosen. <laughs> Can you tell us about how that works? So um, let's start at the very beginning of the work. Um, and what I would like them to do is to play the thing that's going to be the most important musical element that you all have to remember. It's the whole basis of the whole work. And it's a chord. And it's played in a very special way. And I would like them to just play it. And I want you to listen for something long, short. Do it one more time. There it is up there. Long, short. And you remember it. You will never, ever, ever forget that sound. If you 
take this, if you ever go and get a score of this, go home and play it on the piano. It's a, it's a revelation of how it feels on the piano itself, let alone what we hear in the string quartet. But it is a remarkably simple chord. It is a remarkable simple element. It is made up of nothing but perfect fifths. See up there on the right side. And these fifths historically are important for musicians because it comes from what we know as the harmonic series. Some of you might have known the harmonic series, the overtone series. Quickly take a string, pluck it as a pitch, divide it in half, get an octave above that, divide it into three parts, and you get the fifth above that. It's the first interval outside of the octave in nature. And that's really important. So what you can see is a cycle of fifths. If you take a look at the bottom part, you see that C sharp one, two. All he's doing is doing a cycle of fifths all the way up. And he's pulling certain notes out of that cycle of fifths. Many of you have heard of circle of fifths. Same kind of thing that's there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Clara play her violin open strings. What are you going to hear? Perfect fifths. Isn't this fun? <laughs> Viola gets to do it now. Great sound. You hear it every time the orchestra tunes. Now they get to do the cello. Ooh, the cello's out of tune. <laughs> we get to tune. Pluck too hard. <laughs> Now what I'm going to have Russ do is play his two notes, C sharp and G sharp. Beautiful. Now the F and C. Now the G and D. All together. You know, it's made up of such simple, simple, simple ideas. Now, not only does he have this chord, but he has a chord progression. How many of you heard of chord progressions? Yes. Composers have to have them. They have to have this harmony thing that's going to take you on an emotional journey from places of stability to places of instability, because that's what they're all about. Dutia does the same thing, but they're not the kind of chords that you would hear if you were doing little harmony exercises, if you were playing Mozart or Beethoven, but he's got to create something that has an arc, that has a journey. In this piece, he has two chord progressions that he uses. We're just gonna deal with the first one, and I'd like you to hear this chord progression. Please note that they are numbered one through 10, and we return to one. Pretty cool, right? Now that's just on the piano, but it gives you a nice clear idea of the trajectory of this chord progression. It has an arc, it starts from the R chord that we know so well, moves up, gets more tense, and it relaxes on the way down. What I'd like the quartet to do now is to play this. Uh, there's some uh, pizzicato stuff at the very beginning, but we're going to just do it all chords, arco, all the way through. We're going to do it slowly so that you can hear it. Do it one more time. We're going to do it a little faster, um, and we're going to create that big arc, and then we're going to do it. I'm going to have them play it right after that, the original way that Dutia does it in the score. It's 
It's amazing. You will never forget that. And you're going to hear this thing over and over and over again in the quartet. Um, one of the interesting things that he does with this is how he orders it. Imagine uh, music going backwards. Do you think that it could ever, ever, ever go backwards? So what I want you to do is listen to this again, and then we're going to look at the score to see about what the backwards part is. But I want them to do it with all the pizzicato and rhythm that you will originally hear it with. So you will notice that of the 10 chords that you heard, at the beginning he only uses five. There's one, two, three, four, five, hold it, and backwards, four, three, two, one. That doesn't happen in Mozart, Bach, Haydn, because it's hard to make music the way it's constructed in the common practice go backwards because of where things are in the circle of fifth. But because of the way these chords are constructed and their shape and their sound, you can go forward and you can go backward. And he's trying to deal with this issue of time and memory and how it goes. So what I'd like them to do now um, is to, what's my next thing? Play it one more time, because I gotta find where I am in this thing. <laughs> Beautiful. It's really, really, really cool. This whole idea of, of course, palindrome is about memory. It's about the idea of being able to think about, when you think about a memory and you're sitting at nighttime and you're having a lovely cocktail, you say to your, you know, you're thinking about something, do you think of it linearly? Our memory is really always linear. No, sometimes you start here and you go backwards. Sometimes you go forward. Sometimes you analyze, how could I do that? Why did I do that? Why is this happening? So memories are not always linear. And so what he's done here is to try and make a reflection in music, in the chord progressions, of how our memories and our mind in time actually work in that way. The second thing that we have to deal with is the linear idea. There is a four note turn motive in this piece. And that's the second thing that you need to deal with tonight and listen to. And um, you know, before we do that, I wonder if we could just explore a couple of other ways where he brings how, how he brings in the INC chord, you know, like, oh, the, we the forgot to do that. We forgot one. to do the travelogue. I have to do my travelogue. <laughs> do my travelogue. You know, I'm winging it tonight. <laughs> it's but it's fun. You know, you never, ever, ever know. Travelogue time. So, um, the first thing that we're going to listen to for the travelogue is um, did, uh, is the parentheses one. one. And we're going to listen to the first half of this parentheses because then the turn motive happens. See, I'm getting so excited. i got to get back. <laughs> first half. And before I do that, we're going to hear it, the chord, but it's going to be all broken up. So think about this, you have verticalities and then you can arpeggiate something, all right? It's just a way a composer can deal. So now we're gonna hear the arpeggiated, deconstructed version. Wow. <laughs> that didn't sound like a chord. <laughs> at all. <laughs> Go ahead, you can ask my your question. <laughs> I'm just ruining it for all of you. I really am. Well, tell us about, I mean, yeah. so I put this graphic up on screen, and here we can see how these 10 different um, chords have been laid out and how do you like? Yeah, how do you like the, the colors, you know? <laughs> I was good at coloring when I was a kid. <laughs> so remember those, those chords? Well, I've labeled them, I've circled them, because it was my way of, of seeing things really, really easily. And as you, as you look at it, you can see from the left, 
Right? The cello starts down there. I put it in yellow over there. That's the chord. That's the original chord that you heard, but it's now broken up. And the viola helps play it as well. And then you see two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then we stop, and then we're going to get the turn motive. But it's, it's all broken up. Can I have you guys play that one more time? And then we're going to show a little fabulous clip of Dutia. Beautiful. So this this thing that we've just played, uh, do you sort of points to it as being one of the points in the piece where he wondered if maybe he had gone a little too far um, for the players? And uh, Kendall shared this uh, interview with do you with us that uh, is is so charming. So we just have to play it, and it's him sort of elucidating this exact moment in the piece. <laughs> Sounds like me so on the piano. That, that, There's more. <laughs> the, the best part is he's eating it so hard. <laughs> Maybe now we can do our little scavenger hunt. It, it comes back many times. It's not always easy to recognize, sometimes more so. Um, but why don't you lead us through a couple of different um, Lightning round. Lightning round time, yeah. Um, so as, it, as uh, he played, isn't that amazing to hear a composer play their own piece and struggle through their own things, you know? And then, <laughs> then he says, well, it doesn't matter that I struggle. I'll just pass the struggle along, you know? <laughs> because they'll have to deal with it instead. But it's wonderful to see him go through that. And then, as you saw on the screen, the difficulty in notation, a notation problem. So let's do this little um, scavenger hunt thing. So the next time we hear this chord in, its, in it, any of its meeting, it's at the end of parentheses two. And we go into litanies number one. And I will turn it over to the quartet to play this little excerpt that you see up here. You recognize the chord progression that you heard before? That's all there, right there. In order, going up and coming back down. But that chord resonates. It's going to be there as the little Madeline. The next one we want to do uh, is at the end of Miroir. And I would like to have Russ play the little red box that's up there. One, it does two things. It lets you hear the chord, but only in the cello. But it also gives you an idea of these harmonics that we call the harmonic series. Hmm. 
It's amazing what cellos can do. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to know. Did you know that the cello has the widest range of all the instruments, save the harp and the piano? So forth. Is that why they act that way? It's not the why they act. <laughs> busted. Yes, totally, totally busted. Now I'd like you to hear it in context with what you see around it. Isn't it amazing how you can tap your bow and let, let it ricochet on the string and slide your finger and everybody gets to the same note at the end. It's really, really cool. The next one presents the chord as you know it, but it's been slightly changed with some new notes in it. And, and it looks like that up there in the two boxes up there. So same chord, but just changed different, like memory. You get it. It's harder to hear that time because it's been altered a little bit, but the materials are the same. Last we're going to do is the beginning of parentheses four, and you're going to hear the chord progression going up and coming down. You see those chords going up and coming down. That's the chord progression landing on our big chord. <laughs> That's the core, and it's going to show up all over the place as place marks of memory. So that you go back and you say, oh, I remember that. I know what that's all about. But the next thing that I ran into too quickly is our four note little motive. And remember that composition is all about two things, the vertical and the horizontal. Composers have to deal with those elements. Uh, unless you're only doing rhythm, then you don't have to deal with any of it. But, you got to have harmony of some kind, and you've got to have melody, some kind of motive. And that four note motive, I'm going to have Clara play for you. Right up there, on the left. You played those notes, not at that, that particular um, range, but she played them in harmonics up high. It's a beautiful little motive. Notice that the last note and the first note are the same. And the ones in the middle are a half step below and a half step above. You can't get any easier than that. <laughs> I know questions over here. We're going to get questions later. <laughs> I'll be really happy to do that. But I'd like you to play it one more time. It's there in the box of green. next place that it happens is in the beginning of the movement of miroir. You can see it right there, but notice the difference in the color of the notes and look at the difference in the speed and the volume of the notes. What I'm going to do is have them play just that little spot there. Notice there's the Ein C chord down there in the cello as the pitch comes up. I'm going to have them play that, but play it slowly so that you can hear it all together. Now it's crunched up as chords. <laughs> it's hard doing it when at the tempo you're not used to doing it, but they did really well. <laughs> but you heard that. Da, da, dee, da, da, da. Now I'm going to have them play it at the tempo they know. Amazing. So two different ways that you can get this same little idea. The next one happens at parentheses two. Clara has the high notes again, way up there. You can see there it says an octave higher than what's there. And then you have this absolutely beautiful um, tapestry of harmonics and rhythm underneath it. But it's really, I'm going to have them play it in here.
recognized it, but it had a couple of notes that were new. But that's cool. You go, ah, recognize it, but oh, isn't it beautiful how it changes itself. We're going to go on to parentheses number three. And here you can see that um, the second violin is going to start in pizzicato this time, not in the beautiful things. That's going to pass to Clara over there for the first violin. And then on the second score, you can see it in the second violin and then also on top of each other in the green box in viola and first violin. Let's hear it. Isn't that cool what you can do with four notes? If I gave you four notes, what could you do with them? You see, that's the thing. And seriously think about that. For those of you, I gave you four notes. What can you do with four notes? But look at what he does. Look at how he changes the color. Look at how he changes the emotion, the feeling, the sound. That's what comp great composing is all about. Taking simple, simple ideas. What's the theme of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony? <laughs> da, ta, ta, da, da. How, many, how many notes is that? Two. It's two notes, four actual <laughs> rhythms. Right. What did Beethoven do with four notes, you say? So it's, the, it's what you do with it. It's your imagination. That's what makes it so really, 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 really cool. Um, so we're in a minute. We're gonna put the Frankenstein back together, play the whole thing. But we haven't really talked at all about the, the last movement, suspended time. So before we play it again, um, maybe just talk a little bit about what we should listen for in that movement. So um, this is my favorite part of the, my talk tonight, and giving to you what this is all about, Alfie. Um, and that is that this piece ends in a most amazing and remarkable way where the first part of this piece has been interrupted by these parentheses, these little asides to say, hey, this is this. This is what you're supposed to be hearing. This is what you're supposed to know. The last part of it, constellations, nocturne two, and suspended time have no break because there is a different perspective now where we walked into night music with bugs and lots of sounds of the night and our experience of earthly things that were there, and we listen and we repeat and we anticipate and all of that, what eventually happens in nighttime if you have a beautiful clear sky? Where do your eyes go? They go up. They go up to the stars. They go up to that thing that takes us out of time. Remember, this has all been about time. And when we gaze into the heavens, we gaze into what now becomes the concept, for many of us, of eternity, of without time, in search of lost time. For me, this is the most poignant part of the quartet because it's the most meaningful relationship to Proust in search of lost time. Because if you're gazing at the stars, how far out is eternity? How far out do you go? You see, and how does time operate out there? Is there? How do you measure time when you're out there? So we have constellations that begins this last s section of three movements. Constellations. Where are we tonight? Constellations. <laughs> now you know why you're here. <laughs> Now you know why they put it here. <laughs> because it has to do with the beginning of this last, last section of the quartet. Constellation, your gaze is above. And then he repeats nocturne now to night. And 
then the culmination of it all is suspended time, because that's where you're looking. The constellations only exist in suspended time, at least from our perspective or many of our perspectives. And so it's about our two worlds. It's about this earthly world, and it's about that world out there, whatever that may be, and however we wish to describe it. And so our experience in that is going to be very different because these movements are going to sparkle like the stars. You're going to hear frenetic energy in the quartet that is not in the first part of this at all. There's some really cool things that happen, but the last part of it is this <gasps> part. And then there's one last thing I want you to listen for. Actually, two. <laughs> One is there's going to come a moment where everyone's going to stop playing and you're going to feel like clapping. Is this over? That's what you're going to say. You are not allowed to clap. <laughs> it is written in the score as a big, huge fermata over all their parts, and there are no bar lines. It's just a fermata, and there's no whole rest, half rest. We don't know how long that fermata is to last. And they play some more. And then in the score, there are two fermatas. We don't know how long he wants them to be. I assume it's double the first. More music. Three fermatas. So these spacings get longer and longer. You're looking at the stars. Things happen, and then oh, this awe moment. Things happen, longer off. Things happen even longer off. And then you hear the chord again, but in a very new context, and a very new guise. And up there you see the first and the last, the original chord and the last version of the chord. And that last chord is going to come in, da 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 I want you to notice the D, for those of you who read music, the D above middle C there goes down to the bottom but on the very last chord. You see the C sharp on the bottom of the first chord goes up to the C sharp up there. In space. And so there are relationships that exist. Also the G sharp in the bass is the same G sharp over there. So that there are relationships, but by the time we get to the end, our chord is different, just like our experience and our memory and everything that we have traveled through this piece with is now different. It's the same but different. And that's the whole point. And that's what he wants you to experience. He wants you to have that uh, moment of recognition and change, and then you're new. It's a metamorphosis. It's, it's a beautiful way of dealing with time, sound, and music. I know of no other composer who is as interested in this phenomenon that we are going to experience tonight than Dutia. And he, from his first symphony onward, this has been, going back to what Russ asked me earlier, his obsession, his obsession with time and with memory. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Stay there for a moment. Thank you so much. Um, you can imagine what it's been like to work with Kendall over the last couple of months here on this piece. We've learned so much, and he has brings so much energy to it, and we're so thankful Thank you. to you. Before we let him go back into the audience, I wonder if there's anybody has any questions about anything raised tonight. Uh, keep things to questions and not comments. We, 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 we'll hear your comments after the show. Um, but if you have any questions, anything we didn't quite understand, that you want, us, you want us to elucidate one more time before we perform it again, now's the time. And I see a hand up over here. Yes, go ahead. Uh, sorry, it's a comment. Oh, well then, no. <laughs> I, said, uh, I said questions. Rudy, okay. talk to me after the show, OK? <laughs> It is. It's, it's, it's in memory of, of uh, Olga and uh, 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 
because she was the one who commissioned it, not in memory of her, but of the of Aaron's assessment. Well, is that not the opening motive to the base concerto that he wrote? Yes. Uh, it is. Rob, do you, you play bass? That's an audience plant fair. right there. Nerd. Yeah, <laughs> we would we bring the nerds out to Spectre Quartet concerts, no doubt. Thank you, Rudy. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. They right. are. Yep. They yes. are. Yes. 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 They are. Excellent. You all don't know how to ask questions. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. I kid. I kid. I yeah. Well. <laughs> Other questions? Any questions? Yeah. He did. He did. And he loved Webern's work, particularly because his entire aesthetic was about this wonderful color that you can get out of instrumentation and what you can do with, with things. And the Bagatelles, of course, just nothing but color and written so many years before. So yes, he was very much inspired by those pieces and the string quartet and so forth of Webern, but most definitely uh, inspired by Yeah, so for the, when you first hear it, he separates it from everything else and tries to be very sort of square about it. Each time it comes back, what it does, it starts to stratify over the top of itself so that it gets thicker and thicker and thicker in the tapestry and texture of what's going on in the quartet. And so it come, goes from this simplistic, very square presentation to what he does with the chord and other things where he starts to layer it on top of each other. And so it becomes more dense. And so I wouldn't say that there is necessarily a proportional relationship for all of that, but what he does try to do is to try and, and create a polyphony, a stratification of it, as if you're you know, creating an imitative process, as it were, not canon, not fugue, but uh, simple polyphony and imitation. Okay, I think we'll um, leave it there for the questions. Um, and let us all please give one more big thank round of applause you, to you, Dr. Thank Kendall Briggs. Thank, thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Great fun. Thank you. So, um, before we play again, we want to say some thank yous. Um, first of all, thank you to Constellation, to Peter Margershak, to Mike Reed, to the staff here um, to, for making this um, a really fun event for us and making it easy for us. We thank you so much. Um, we want to say thank you to our supporters. Not only do these institutions support us, but many people in this room support us. We want to say thank you to all of you for making our work possible, not only this program, but um, for being with us uh, for so many years and supporting our work. Um, and we just couldn't do it without you. Also, two specific people. We have a, a number of board members here tonight, so thank you, Spectral board members, especially Nina Kim and um, Sarah Orwig tonight, who have sponsored our reception. We hope you'll stick around, use those drink tickets, uh, hang out with us and ask us questions and tell us sort of how your hearing of this piece evolved over the, the evening. We'd be very eager to, to hear your your comments and your questions um, afterwards. Um, we, um, we have a lot left this season to offer you all, um, and we still need support for those, um, for those uh, events. So we would ask you to go to our website if you are so inclined and you have the means uh, and support our season. Um, for the remainder of this year, we have a lot to bring uh, you and including let me just tell you if you enjoyed this program tonight We're going to do one more of these once more with feeling shows on February 4th here in this room um, With our good friend Samuel Adams who wrote us uh, just an incredible piece of music that we'll be recording this spring um, And we're going to bring him here from California or from from Nevada 
to uh, <laughs> to uh, uh, to uh, to share his music with you uh, on February fourth. So come back for that. Um, I think that is it for announcements. We um, thank you all for being here. And again, stick around afterwards, and we hope you'll enjoy the second performance of Ainsi La Nuit.
Thank <laughs> you. 